Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor and the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app. We're now on Red Circle as well as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Five Reasons YouTube channel. You can get all of our other content on South Florida teams there too. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, and also turn your notifications on. Check out FiveReasonSports.com for the latest written content without a paywall. And the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. You Break Wheel Fix, YouBreakWheelFix.com. They're based in North Miami. This is the complete automotive wheel solution. Mark and his team, they can do everything for you. If you ever had problems with wheels because of bends, cracks, curb rash, everything that happens here on the streets of South Florida, your wheels are maybe faded or peeling, they can take care of that for you. But they can also make them look nice if you just want that. They take care of the powder coating, the machining, the polishing. They can give you the cool colors and all of that stuff. Check them out at YouBreakWheelFix.com. Again, that's YouBreak wheelfix.com based in the Aventura area 305-748-0112 that's 305-748-0112 mention us to mark five reasons and you'll get a discount and now today's episode down to this day yay uh five on the floor ride for my dogs where here's the thing you can check the score hustle hard couple scars wearing bubble frogs just like brother said you in trouble y'all kept the floor playing got an all band y'all seen the block stop the one hand and pat we trust it's power have the guts we here to bring the heat y'all can hang it up Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Five on the Floor. Here's today's floor plan. I'm Ethan Skolnick. You can follow me at Ethan J. Skolnick and at Five Reasons Sports. I got Greg Sylvander. You can follow him at Greg Sylvander. And today's special guest, he's been with us before, but there's never a better time than this particular week. You can follow his work on ESPN. Of course, he's a former NBA executive, uh, worked with the Nets for years. You can follow him on Twitter at Bobby Marks 42 He's appropriately named Bobby Marks. Bobby, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, guys. I thought I was going to be coming on. When you sent the invite, I thought we were going to be coming on talking Bradley Beal of the Heat. Oh, but don't, things change don't do in that. the world. <laughs> you know what? I saved you today because this could have been a live episode and I did not want you having to deal with the comments because um, you, you're in Miami from time to time. You know how they get and they're supposed to get every star, every player that is is photoshopped to them, every jersey swap. Uh, every single guy is supposed to go to them. And when they don't get who they want, there's 24 hours. Well, first they blame us uh, as the messengers and then they kind of blame the Heat uh after that so uh hopefully you won't get blamed for anything you say today we're going to work through this stuff with you quickly but i I do want to start there because even as we we are starting here there's more news on dame but let's start with beal um were you surprised um as far as phoenix and what the price was no i i wasn't i wasn't surprised i just i just thought all along um that the no trade certainly played a role i i think listen if Bradley Beal really wanted to be in Miami, if that was his first destination, Bradley Beal would be in Miami. I mean, that's that's how I look at it here. Um, I think for the Heat, I think there was certainly a walkaway number um, or a package, whether how far they were willing to to kind of go in. Um, I was surprised that I probably underestimated Matt Ishbia, the Suns owner, which probably I shouldn't have done based off the rant because he basically just took a torch to the CB new CBA as far as going all in. And especially when you traded all your first in the, uh, in the Nets trade and, but you still wind up sending out, I guess maybe six seconds and pick swaps here. You still had whatever was left here. Um, so I wasn't surprised that it was for expiring contracts and there was really no value from, from the wizard's perspective. Cause I felt all along that's what it was probably going to be to get the, the, uh, the Beal um, number off. I thought it was going to take a little bit longer, but the reality is we're in this window here when this new CBA is going to start on July 1st. And you're basically have this 125% trade, you know, to trade players and it's going to decrease to 110%. And certainly with the Chris Paul guarantee, which I think he gets most, I think he's getting most of the money here. Um, so not, not totally caught off guard here. I, I want to let Greg follow you in a second, but I have one thing here. If you're Miami, cause I, I know initially you put up the, and this was kind of a guide for a lot of people uh, you know, what Miami could give up 
in that trade, which was something along the lines of like Lowry Robinson and a future protected first. It seemed like it was kind of heading that direction, although we heard a lot during the negotiations about wanting the 18 pick this year, uh, wanting Jovic at one point. Uh, I know his name came up. Highsmith's name came up. We actually heard, and I haven't reported this uh, anywhere yet, that Caleb Martin's name came up uh, during the course of the negotiations. I guess, I guess if you were Miami, would you have gone further for a guy who's going to be making $61 million at the end of that contract? No, because it gives you basically gives you no net, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you you need a you need a, an out somewhere here, um, and whether it be with Tyler Hero or your younger players or pick eighteen or your two thousand twenty eight or two thousand thirty, like like if you go all in, man, you better make sure. Like Bradley Beal is a good player. I think he's a, he's probably your second best, second or third best player on a really good team. Uh, um, if this was Kevin Durant, I would have said go all in, man, give everything you got. Right, Kevin. If Kevin Durant had a no trade and he had Miami on the top, of, you know, list, I'd say give him what you want. Give him three ones. Give him hero. Give him whatever here. But I do think, I did think you have to, you know, as you guys know, the he front office has great restraint. Um, and I think certainly, what's the big one that will? There's going to be another big one here. So if you're not content on Bradley Beal, you walk away. Fortunately, he doesn't he doesn't he's not going to Brooklyn, right? He's not staying in the Eastern Conference. He can go out west with uh, with Duran here. Um, but I think for me, like I I changed I went from Hero Robinson a first and future. Then I was more like, you know what? What would happen if it was just um, Lowry and like Robinson, and mm-hmm. or what, maybe Lowry or Robinson or Lowry Oladipo. Yeah, and then was that was a Larry Oladipo combination going to cost you two ones like mm-hmm. eighteen and twenty eight? Um, so, um, but I, you know, like I think from Miami's perspective, I don't think you can you can't consider Tyler Hero as just a throw in. Like that's the big thing, and and we live in a world where like we haven't seen Tyler Hero since Game One of the Milwaukee. And I think we sometimes forget he's a good player. Like he's a good player here. And I think you think, wait a minute, they got to the finals and they didn't have Tyler Hero. And so I, I kind of was got trended more towards like, you know, take him out and let's see if you can do a deal. If it's just, you know, basically, you know, whether it be Kyle or Victor or, you know, even Duncan there. So I'll I think Greg the, jump in on the most more the, the next guy. You said there's always another guy. So yeah, you're beating me to the punch there. I've learned a lot, Ethan, from you in terms of transitions. And so this one was lined up perfectly. Uh, the next guy is the guy that's in the headlines now. It's Dame Lillard. Uh, there's a lot of obviously conflicting reports, and it's been years of this is dame ever going to push portland finally and i think that there was even a report today um i think sham sharani uh, was on the pat mcafee show and said something to the effect of he wants to stay in portland he wants portland to get better which to me feels like hey it's the week of the draft let's make sure we're going to use that third pick constructively to build a contender now where I want to go next is because Bradley Beal is a Phoenix son and no matter what heat fans feel about that that's over it's over man it's over. So now we yeah. move on and and you the next guy. And it appears as if it could potentially be Dame. I feel like Chris Haynes tweeting out something with the Miami Heat and, and Dame Lillard in the same sentence last night. That's a bit curious to me. But again, I'm just connecting dots. So here we go. Dame Lillard. Is he the player that you do go all in for? Is he good enough? Um, is he like of that Durant ilk? And yes. from your perspective, what would it ultimately cost for the heat to get Dame Lillard if he signals Miami is his preferred spot. Um to answer your fr- yes, he's a guy I would go in for. Um I mean him, Butler, Bam. I mean you got some toughness there. I mean an all NBA player. Um so yes, I would be I think he's the guy because I'm just I just look at the landscape here and and I don't know if there's another guy out there. Like maybe Jalen Brown, but in the likelihood is he signs that extension. I don't know. Carl Anthony Towns doesn't do anything for me. Um, not with Jimmy. You know, no, no, not with Jimmy. <laughs> Might as well go out and get Wiggins too. Um, so for me, yeah, he's the guy. Now, what's the cost, right? Like, what do you have? You've got you got eighteen, which you could eventually, even if this happens during the summer, you can move. Um, you've got. Two number one, two in the future. Probably could do pick swap somewhere in there. Um, Tyler, 
now what's what else? Like now, like all right, now if they said, you know, we want Tyler, Caleb, Jovic, and something else to get the money to work, and three number ones. Then you're like, you know, I mean, like that. That's you know, then you got to figure it out, right? Like, but here's the thing, like, and I, I guess, and you guys follow this team like crazy, and for me too, living in Southwest Florida, like, I think we're just accustomed to Miami going out and getting guys, right? Like they'll just figure it out. Like they'll just figure it out. I think that's, and they've shown that they can, and that's basically what they would have to do. They would have to go out and, you know, depending on whatever they had to give up and hopefully you can retain some of this, um, you'd have to go out and, and um, you know, kind of fill in the, the, fill in the blanks there. See, but here's the thing about it. It's one thing to say they'll figure it out, which I agree with. Like, like they've done this kind of top heavy roster thing before they did it during the big three. They did it with Shaq and Dwayne. Okay. And that first year after they got Shaq uh, for Odom and Butler and Grant, they plugged it and they had still had Eddie Jones, but they plugged it with Damon Jones and other pieces like that until the next year, they were able to make the big, bigger trades. It's not, I don't lack confidence in their ability to figure it out, particularly with their developmental program, which we know that they can find pretty much any, every agent is going to be calling Adam Simon and the rest of them after the draft and saying, get my guy to Miami, because I know you can make a player out of him and, and or, or Spokane and the entire organization. My problem is for them is that there's so many factors that have been out of their control lately. And, and I think that's where Heat fans are frustrated because you look at the Dame thing. Okay, I, I'm with you. Like, if you get Dame to me, you throw everything out there now. Like, it's Dame, Jimmy, and Bam, and just figure out the rest. Okay, like I, there's no doubt in my mind that that organization with Pat, Adam, Chet, Camera, etc., they'll do that. But there's other things that need to happen first. And I just, uh, a, I, I don't know that Dame's going to ask out, and I don't know that how they can know that Dame's going to ask out because we're we're two days, three days before the draft here. We don't know what's going to happen with number three. Now there's the talk about Zion, right? Is that enough? I mean, the idea of Portland bringing in a guy who's been injury prone with their history with injury prone players is hysterical to me. But I mean, if that's the direction, is that enough to keep Dame? And and so you need that first. And then there's the whole public relations angle with the Blazers trading Dame and how that looks for them and how it looks for Dame to ask out. I just think there are too many unknowables to put all your eggs in the Dame basket. Like I, I'm with you in terms of the the pieces you put in. Yes, throw it all at them. But it still might not be enough because Portland could still say, sorry, Dame, we're not sending you to Miami. We're sending you to say your old employer about the Nets. Yeah. Who have, who, who, first who have, more, who, who have the more equity out of all this. Right. You're right. I mean, you hit it right in the head. I mean, like the only thing you if you're a heat fan that you would hang your hat on, or if you work in that front office, is that how much equity he has built with that organization where it's kind of like a quasi no trade. Unless, you know, like a team like Brooklyn comes in, you know, we're going to give you five unprotected ones, we'll give you all the Phoenix ones, and we'll give you the Dallas one. Then it's like, well, if you're Portland, you know, no matter how much allegiance he's had, you have to do what's best for your organization here. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the that's the, the challenge here. And, and I, I'll say this with Lillard, like Damian Lillard is going to get traded when Damian Lillard wants to get traded. Like he has to go in there. If he wants to go to Miami, I don't want to hear it anymore on these shows. And I know we basically mm-hmm. was pieces were taken from that show and it was an all and they they basically asked him like, you know, a, you know, a question that he gave and it turned into a hot bite. Like, I don't want to hear it anymore. Like either the roster is good enough and you're content, or go in there and ask to be traded. Mm-hmm. Hold on, like a lot of players have done. Jimmy did it, you know, and it worked out better for him. And I think with um you know, I think with Lillard, the, the my question is, is that if it's not now, when is it? And you go out and do Zion, like, and I, you know, you move number three for Zion Williamson or for an established player. What's to say in a, in, in mid season things fall off the wagon? Like that's why, like the the off season is the greatest. It's better than probably when you first get married. Is the greatest honeymoon period ever. Like so everything much hope. is perfect in the world, you know, <laughs> like and when I was in Brooklyn, when we did the Garnett Pierce trade, oh my God, like you thought there would be like elephants marching down Flatbush Ave because the circus, like it was the greatest thing in ever. And then you get to training camp and you see what you got. And then, you, and then I, I go in the bathroom and want to throw up, you know, like, like, <laughs> 
So we live in this world <laughs> where it's like, you know, like, oh, you know, yeah, Zion would be great in New Orleans until you get to you get to um, November and Zion's out with a strained calf and you don't mm. see him again until freaking March. So I do think if you're if you're Damian Lillard, you have to be careful looking at them going out and moving three for an established player. Or I think if you're the trailblazers, you have to be careful thinking you moving three for an established player will convince Damian Lillard to stay because what happens if he leaves, then mm-hmm. you're not, then you're, you basically missed out on Scoot or Brandon Miller or one of these other players. So you're right. There's so many different layers here where it, is not this is different than Beal, where it's basically I have no trade clause. This is where I want to go. Boom, 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 deal. Where there's so many different variables here. But even that didn't work out for Miami in the sense that they had the no trade clause. We thought they were the leaders in the clubhouse as of Saturday, and then all of a sudden Phoenix popped up. I got one follow here uh, before Greg jumps in, and, and that's this: If you were in the Heat front office, and you know the Heat front office, obviously you know Andy, you know all those guys. What would you have to know? To, to go all in on Dame. In other words, do you need to know from one of the players on your team, say Jimmy or Bam, he's coming. He's coming. Because we know the relationship that Dame has with Bam. We can talk tampering and all the rest of this stuff. But yeah. we, we yeah. know, obviously, that, that, that players talk to each other. And they can't. Look, LeBron spoke to Dame two off seasons ago, and it came out afterwards and all the rest of that. Like, Root what chats. would you have to – like, how how comfortable do you need – what would make you comfortable if you're Pat or Andy that, okay – Dame wants to go this time because you mentioned you mentioned KG and I know you got him at the tail end right in in Brooklyn but before that I mean KG is the example for this I mean he didn't want to leave Minnesota forever and then basically Mikhail and and you know Ainge made a buddies deal <laughs> and and KG was convinced to go to Boston and he ended up winning a championship but that's the closest parallel that I can find to this but what what would you have to know if you're Andy, if you're Pat, if you're Adam Simon, if you're if you're Mickey Harrison, if you're any of the decision makers in that front office. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you hit a right hand. I mean, I think it's different than him being on the last year of his contract and would he resign, right? We don't have to worry about this because the Lillard contract extends out based off his extension last offseason. Like, yeah, I mean, is he all is he all in? Is he willing to commit? Because then that sets in the wheels in motion as far as how much are we, you know, how much are we are we willing to kind of go all in? And I think I think what you have and, and why that's important is, and I go back to my time with the Nets, is that we went through it with New York with Carmel Anthony, right? Like you don't want to get in a position where all of a sudden you kind of read the tea leaves. Yeah, I think he's in. And then Brooklyn all of a sudden puts the the, the whopper of an offer in there and you'd be like, man, what just happened? Like why? Like and that's almost that's almost what happened to the Knicks when we went through because we basically threw everything out with Carmelo and and Denver was like you know what I think this this New Jersey offer is really good and New York was like no and they got fortunate because at the last minute they were able to kind of change the deal around here but yeah I mean I think that's I think you hit it on the head as far as you have to know um, you know is is he is he fully in with this one more thing on Dame before we before we go on I just have to sneak this in. His loyalty to Portland, I said this last night on our episode, and I have to get your perspective on this. If he's actually going to finally ask out, is he really going to look at the Brooklyn situation as it currently stands versus a situation like Miami and signal that? Like, I think to your point, if Portland does do right by Dame, don't you think Dame is going to have a ton to say with that? And I just, I, I find that it's a little unrealistic that Dame is going to be happy with the idea of landing in a place where he may be a four seed or a five seed, like essentially what Portland would be if they made the all in move. So I, I'm just, I'm interested if how much it influences the fact that the Heat are a finals team and they have uh, known pillars, a great coach organization, et cetera, in place now. Yeah, I mean, he said it on that that Showtime piece, like, you know, hey, like, the, basically, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Like, you know, just because I'm going somewhere, what else, what's coming back? What What is that team losing here? And I think certainly the Heat's track record as far as whether, you know, getting to the NBA Finals, winning the Finals, Eastern Conference Finals. I mean, it, there's really, there's never really a lean, there hasn't been really a lean year. I guess the leanest year was the year they got swept by Milwaukee um, in 2000. Um, in you know, right after the, they 21. lost in the finals to the butt, yeah, in twenty one, um, so that's that would be for him. Like, what's you know, Brooklyn? You get to play with Mikael Bridges, Cam Johnson, who you know, Ben Simmons, right? So, and I think, which is, hey, you're probably you're certainly a, you're a playoff team, and you're probably a five, four or five seed. But I think 
whenever you want to make this type of shift, when you've been in the league 13 years and you've been committed to one organization, like you're, you're not doing it just to be the six seed. Like you're doing, like when Garnett went to Boston with Ray Allen, like he went there to win a championship. Like they didn't go there to be the seventh seed and just get in. Like he could have just stayed in Minnesota to do that. And Lillard could just stay in Portland and try to be, yeah, maybe the West is wide open, you know, outside of uh, Denver and probably now Phoenix, pretty open. Maybe they had a player here and now they're the fifth seed and he could live in Portland here. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, that's from his perspective that you have to, you know, that's how you have to look at it. All right, when we come back, we're going to do some rapid fire here with Bobby to close on some of the other topics here, but we definitely wanted to get to the Damon Beal stuff. First, we're sponsored here, as always, by our friends over at Better Edge. This is legal sports betting. It's legal sports betting, legal in 44 states, including the state of Florida, because you're betting against others who play it. You're not betting against the app or a bookie itself. And also, because it's based in Minneapolis, not, say, Costa Rica, you will actually get your money. So go to betteredge.com. That's with an O, betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. You'll get $20 to play. And we're running a draft contest. Our guy, Sean Rochester, is putting it up right now. You answer questions for the draft. It's a competition with money at the end of it for you. So go to betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. Get $20 off. Also sponsored by friends over at Water Cleanup. If you've got any kind of a leak, Reach out to Michael Robert and his team. That's at WCUFL.com, WCUFL.com. Water cleanup, totally trusted, based in Boca, but they can service the entire area when they had hurricane issues and all that stuff on the west coast of Florida. They were out there uh, to helping as well. Again, WCUFL.com. And they've got a they've got a preventative program now, so maybe you can stop those leaks before they start because we know that insurance companies don't always – Take care of you. So reach out to our friends, Water Cleanup of Florida, WCUFL.com, fully licensed, insured, and certified building contractors. If you have damage that needs to be addressed, they'll handle it from start to finish. Michael on his personal cell, 954-579-0356, 954-579-0356. Greg, if you've got the schmutz. They got the guts. All right, let's see if Bobby's got the gut. Well, I know he does. Uh, for some of our rapid fire stuff, I, I'll 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 do the first one here because I don't know if this is gonna be rapid fire or not. But okay, could you please explain why the Miami Heat would not want to be a second apron team based on the new CBA? Yeah, I mean, I think this year I, the second apron for this year alone is 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 basically watered down. There's it it doesn't have really much teeth um, this year. So if you're a second apron team, meaning you're I think it's projected $180 million. You're over that. Basically, you don't have your $5 million tax mid level. You can, uh, the, the instead of taking back 125% in salary in a trade, is 110%. Um, you won't be able to sign a player that's bought out of his contract, whose original contract was more for, it was more than a non tax. So, for example, you wouldn't have been able to sign Kevin Love in a deal. So, those are really the punitive restrictions for this year, second apron. Now, what happens next year is like when the teeth come. Like here it comes like so now it's it's basically you don't have your tax mid level exception. You can't send out cash in a trade, so you can't go out and buy draft picks for trade purposes. You can't aggregate salary. So let's say Damian Lillard says, "Oh, I love Portland," and then next year he says, "Oh, I don't love Portland, and I want to go to Miami." Well, you're in a second apron next year. You won't be able to aggregate Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson together in a deal. Like that's one of the big things there. And what else? It uh, restricts you from um, uh, your draft picks. So if you're in the second apron in next year, then your pick in 2032, and I know that we're basically like my kids will probably be married by then, and um, you, that pick in 2032 now becomes frozen, meaning you not cannot trade that pick. If you are in a second apron for next year, and two out of the next four years, so basically you got to be in it three three years, which is very hard to do. Then by 2032, let's say you have a really bad year and you have the fourth pick in the draft. Well, you don't have the fourth pick in the draft. That goes all the way back to pick 30. So it moves back all the way there. Wow. So it restricts there. So a lot of these rules are for next year and for future years. Um, what else there is in there? You, um, Let's say um, Kyrie Irving is signed and traded to the Lakers, and then all of a sudden 
the Heat want to acquire Kyrie Irving. You cannot go out and acquire a player who first signed his contract in a signing trade. That goes off the table here. Um, so yeah, I mean, the second apron is it's you know there's punitive rules in there. They basically did it to eliminate teams from having three max players. Um, to, if you if you have your own picks and you draft well and you can find under the radar, you're just basically paying you're you're paying the luxury tax here. But it's meant to be more punitive as far as how you build your roster outside of your players. I said it last week. It's like you can't you can have the steak, but you can't have the lobster and order two more desserts, right? Like you could still eat well, but you just can't go out and get Bruce Brown in free agency. That's a great analogy. I love that and. To your point about this, and we I appreciate the clarification because it's been hard to track like when does that happen and yeah. uh when how punitive does does it become how soon? So I appreciate the clarification there. As I understand it, and shout out to Albert Namad, who I think all three of us know and is he's a salary cap enthusiast himself. Al- Albert Albert was like in a like all of a sudden, Albert like reappears like every once in a while. Yeah. And like, he did Albert, today. Albert hasn't appeared um since February and then Sunday morning, I um, wake up and I get a direct message from Albert. And I said, I was like, where the heck have you been? And he says, Hey, I heard there's this new CBA out. Can you help me? And I said, I can help you out. My brother, you're one of the best here. So Albert has reappeared. He has. Um, and that's a great story. I love that. Um, he tweeted this earlier, the heat project to have a team salary of 185 million plus that's what they're facing without any salary dumps. That's a $55 million tax bill, $240 million in total payroll. You just went over the implications of the apron, so we're going to not talk about that. Dame and Beal aside, with the Heat in the position that they are currently financially with um, basically being – as I understand it, a second apron team as it stands now, I think that they obviously are going to make moves to change that. How do you approach the off season? Like how do you balance balancing the books versus improving the roster when you're a contending team? Is this a weird summer where you're going to see more balancing of the books? So some trades on the surface are going to be like, wow, how did that happen? And then you realize it's financially motivated. I'm interested to pick your brain independent of Beal and Dame. What kind of moves would Miami with their salary structure in place be looking to make this summer? Um, Cause we, it can't all be about Bradley Beal and Dame yeah. Lillard all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you have to separate it into the trade market and then your own players, right? Your own free agents. So I think, I think, I think uh, Gabe's important. I think he's a priority. I think when you look at Gabe and Max, I think Gabe is more important than Max. It's just the reality. Like Max is having another toy in the toy box, right? You got Hero coming back. Go out and find a shooter, right? Like that's basically go tell your scout and tell uh, Adam to go find another shooter out there. Maybe in the draft, maybe you find him there. Maybe you find him uh, on on the minimum here. So I think whatever, whatever trade speculations are where you are, With Damian Lillard or without Damian Lillard, Gabe Vincent is a priority. Okay. So what's the number? 12 million, 13 million, somewhere around there. After that, it's really about your pick. Um, It's kind of just filling in the gaps, right? You have Mm -hmm. some, you know, what are you going to do with Kevin Love? You're restricted to bring him back. I think like three eights is number three seven. Um, So you're restricted there. As far as the trade market goes, you have a window, right? Your window is now into the trade deadline if you want to go big game hunting. That's just the reality of it. That's just the rules, and that's how it's out. If you want to go, you know, if you really go aggressive, it's now until June 30th, okay, before the new rules come into place. When July 1st comes, you can still go out and get Damian Lillard and trade, um, you know, Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson. You can do that. But come the trade deadline – and come next off season, and it's the new harsh second apron starts the day after the regular, the day after, um, I think the the regular season or the first day of the regular season is over. So it's like right away, like mid April, like that's it, mm. like there that, that 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 goes off the off the board and everything like that. So, so I think that's how you kind of break it up as far. As, that's how you break it up as far as you know your own players, and then certainly what you know your window to go out and do a deal. 
Bobby, we'll close here. We appreciate uh, your time with us as always. We know how busy you are, especially this time of year. And I'm glad that we found Albert because he does. I was actually the first to promote Albert when I was on radio shows down here. And then he disappears from me for months and months and months too. So I'm glad to see that he's back. Uh, a lot of people thought he was Andy for a long time. I realized that, right? <laughs> Maybe I, it I is. I used to get that question that this was actually. Yeah, we've Andy. confirmed it's not. Oh, okay. It's not. It's not. It's not. I, I've confirmed it with Andy that it's not. But yes, it, it, for for a, for a long time we thought it might actually be Andy. Uh, but I'll ask this, and this is kind of kind of a, a question. I I, I think um, it may take a little time to think about. What is the Heat's best asset? right now when you take contract into consideration you take age into consideration if you were another team what would be the very first, and i know contracts need to match and i understand that but what is the very first thing that you would ask for that's a great question um what is their best asset caleb martin see i agree with you and wow. i, I and I and I've heard it's, that that it's was a process an issue of limited, in the Washington like, negotiations. Yeah, I want to say Kyle Lowry because he's expiring. We know what their picks are. Picks are good. Eight, you know, it's fine. Um, Hero, I, I think, is an asset, but certainly when you have four years and 120 mm-hmm. million, that's the number. But you got to be comfortable with that. I think where Caleb is, he's got a tremendous contract. He's he's got a player option. You would inherit his bird rights, so you can pay him whatever you want next year. I think that's a, I think he's probably, you know, I'm not, of course, bam, Jimmy, those guys, I'm not, we're taking them off the board here. So that, that would, I would say was for me. Yeah. That would be uh, their best asset. Which is, I agree with you. And it's crazy because heat fans, the way that they reacted to the whole PJ Tucker, Kayla Martin thing last off season and the way that the heat, front office reacts when I don't explain it properly on what it is that they were trying to accomplish there. I have a and, question. I have a question yeah. for you guys. What, 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 what would heat nation be like if you got, if they would have lost to, to Chicago in the playing game? Oh, I can't even imagine. <laughs> it would have been I mean, all about the draft and <laughs> blow it up except for Jimmy and bam. Well, I mean, a lot of heat fans, and again, I'm not disparaging them here. They, they wanted the heat not to make the playoffs to get the 14th pick. And then, almost ended up winning the championship and just sliding down four slots. Right. But so th- there is, there is this argument that I had with a lot of heat fans yesterday, which is like, okay, on one hand you want the heat to be patient and to not give up too much. But uh, on the other hand, you're all completely impatient. And so like pick a side here at some point, right? Like you don't want the heat to give up every asset that they have because you need them to use it for something else. But then when they don't give up and they lose the player, then everybody gets frustrated. And I just think, I think this all comes to this. And again, I, you know, Pat used the term spoiled a few years ago, you know, and the big three heat fans and all the rest of that. And that this pivoted and changed, by the way, Bobby, just to show how the, how this, how the, the salary cap and has exploded. I I did the math today. Beal, Durant and, uh, and Booker will be making exactly three times, exactly three times next season what Wade, Bosch, and LeBron made in 2010, 2011. That's how much uh, the the cap has exploded, the money has exploded. But, I mean, Heat fans, you know, they expect to get everybody. And, and you know, but they expect to get everybody with limited assets <laughs> sometimes and not understanding what the next move is. So, I mean, I, I've said I'll be critical of the front office when they don't act on something they should – but I do think that there was a line for a guy like Bradley Beal who was going to make $61 million in the last year of his contract. I no, just I totally, I totally agree. And I think there was a line for a lot of teams. I'm sure there was a line for Brooklyn and New York. And, you know, I didn't think Milwaukee had enough to get in there. And, um, but I would have just loved to see what the mar- what his market would have been if there was no trade. Yes. That's what it would be. You know, I mean, we traded, I mean, real quick, we traded for Joe Johnson in 2012. Four expirings and a future first. Probably would have got more for Beal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just, you know, that the, the, as we've talked about the, the trade, no trade, just, just squeeze the market. Are we ever going to see one of those again? I don't think so. Given to I a mean, player of Beal's caliber, a really, really good player, oh, but man. not a top five guy in the league. Unless it's Luca on his next contract. If he's there, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind of <laughs> where you, would, that's where you would look at, you know, it's funny when you do it, you don't think. And then like, mm-hmm. you know, and then the Wizards, you know, Tommy Shepard gave it. He's not there anymore. You go in a different direction as far right. as um, <clears throat> from an ownership perspective, I mean, from a front office perspective. All right, Bobby, we appreciate it. Follow me at Bobby Marks. 
42. Check out all the other content on our YouTube channel and elsewhere. Check out our sponsors, You Break, Wheel Fix, Water Cleanup, Better Edge. Use the code 5RSN. That's the code 5RSN. And also at Prize Picks, use the code 5FIV. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.